Hello, how's it going? So yeah, I'm Ian from Fabric. We're a venture contributor supporting founders you know, throughout their entire uh, entrepreneurial life cycle from pre-idea through incubation with our pre-seed program, FabricX, through to venture capital needs with the Seed Series A fund, Fabric Ventures, and through Series B onwards with the Growth Fund, and then also providing liquidity throughout if the you know, decentralized finance project or need assets uh, as a gaming project, then we have Fabric Capital to support them there as well. Um, I'm joined by two lovely guests here. Uh, we've got Mike from Lattice, if you want to say a few words. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Zyko. I'm a partner and co-founder at a fund called Lattice. Uh, we're about a year old, um, so if you haven't heard of us yet, that might be the reason. Uh, primarily focused on seed stage venture in, in crypto and Web3. Uh, prior to that, uh, my partner and I were actually at, at CoinList. We worked on the Filecoin sale five years ago. So this is, uh, this is fun to be here after having worked with them so many years ago. And we've got Hi. Marcus from QCP. Hi, I'm Marcus from QCP. QCP is a full suite crypto trading firm. Uh, I'm the head of the investments there. We mostly look into early stage investments, but we support everything all the way till Series A. Um, yeah. Cool. So we're talking about, from the investor's perspective, um, about decentralized infrastructure. I think before even sort of diving in, we probably need to define what is infrastructure. And I think um, everyone probably has a slightly different definition, but if you want to you know, jump in, is it just anything non-consumer facing? Is it for you know, dev facing products or just L1s or just the node infrastructure for L1s? What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, to borrow from what you just mentioned, I, I take a relatively simple explanation of infrastructure. It's really anything that um, developers are interacting with in order to build end user applications. Um, there are other definitions that we can talk about. And Picks and shovels is, is in the title and frequently within Within crypto, picks and shovels businesses have largely been um, almost outside of the, the crypto sort of Web3 infrastructure track. So more things like exchanges, custodians, any infrastructure that's necessary to almost service the crypto economy uh, versus infrastructure for crypto's sake in and of itself. So that's the loose definition that I hold. but. You can take it down many different rabbit holes, which I think, Marcus, you've <laughs> back in, you were taking us down to like end-level computing as a potential yeah. Uh, infrastructure. Yeah, I, I, I believe infrastructure is anything that helps client-facing um, applications just function better. Yeah, so, so things that more so on the back end that the company would use. Um, and I think that infrastructure, if you really dig down to the picks and shovels, you could really get down to its base layers. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, in that definition, is an L1 even infrastructure, or is it actually the services that are used to run the nodes, the bare metal, <laughs> you know, how, how deep do you want to go? I would say that it's kind of like a perspective, because the application that runs on top of the protocol layer, I suppose the protocol layer is the infrastructure, but then the protocol utilizes its own form of infrastructure, whether it's uh, node providing service or... RPCs or whatever. So I think there are infrastructures of infrastructures of infrastructures, which could be pretty meta. Yeah, got it. Cool. And then sort of jumping to the other half of that decentralized infrastructure, what does decentralization e even mean? Like it's not just one or zero, right? It's, it's very much a spectrum. So, you know, where in the stack do we need to be decentralized? Does the entire stack need to be decentralized? How, how far should we go there? Yeah, if you speak with developers today, I think their answer would be that you don't have to be that decentralized throughout the entire stack of how they build these applications. That being said, I think further out into the future, I think the expectation is that you will trend further and for that, further in that direction. Because otherwise, like you create these centralized choke points for what you're building. So if the purpose of this is to be decentralized, but you have this one choke point, say in Fura, if you're on Ethereum, then it kind of, it all breaks down. Um, so for the first you know, several years of, of the crypto you know, industry, I think mostly focus on like centralized infrastructure. But what you're seeing now is most of that space is kind of like tapped out from an investment perspective. There's just like aren't as many new entrepreneurs going out and saying, OK, I'm going to build centralized infrastructure. It doesn't really make sense. It's like not, not the future. So like why would you do it? Whereas like you know, to get started, it was like this is we need this. Developers need it. Makes sense. Let's do it. But now it's like everyone trying to kind of take that and reimagine it from a decentralized point of view, uh, which probably presents like most of the most interesting investment opportunities today versus like anything that you might consider 
consider centralized? Yeah, I think I would largely agree. Um, a lot of projects, when they first start out, they have to start off centralized because they need to have a, a certain level of control on the creative direction of where the project will hit to. But I feel like it's very important for them to emphasize that eventually they would like to move to a decentralized model. Um, it is the curve of innovation that cryptocurrency as a whole should head towards because it's one of the greatest benefits that we have being in this industry um, and this technology. Yeah, and if you want to take a concrete example of that, Mike, you mentioned Infura. They've obviously been centralized well, for their entire life so far, um, but recently announced that they will be moving towards a sort of decentralized model. They still capture you know, a large majority of that market compared to competitors, say, Pocket or Beware or others who are trying to go straight into the decentralized model. Do you think there's particular reasons for that? Why they're trending towards well, centralized? Well, why they have been so successful as a centralized model in spite of the entire ethos of the space meant yeah. to be that it's permissionless. In this, in this industry, if you're a develop, like an end user developer, you have this constant tension between delivering a delightful experience for your users and then kind of being decentralized. Because at often you, you lose performance because of that approach. Um, so frequently, like developers, because they want to give a good experience to their users, their users like something to be fast, something to be cheap, uh, not like clunky. Um, you know, they'll choose centralized options, and for for a long period of time, Infura was an excellent um, uh, an excellent option for them. Uh, I think moving forward, you know, you'll see teams use different innovations in order to still enable a positive experience for end users, but like. Start to um, start to decentralize some of that that uh, tech stack, uh, but I think it really just comes down to like the difficulty of delivering a good experience for users versus you know pushing something in a totally decentralized fashion. Yeah, I think that there is a certain trade-off that companies give out if they want to do the decentralization from the start model. Um, a lot of the times, it's because it is we have to acknowledge a very experimental technology. And we're not really sure how the front-facing client should look like. And it's a lot easier to control basically the overall direction of how it will look like or um, basically make really fast changes if it was centralized. But if you were to go for a decentralized model off the bat, uh, it will be hard for you to push out updates sometimes depending on how it's coded. So I feel like work in the beginning, uh, find your product market fit, then focus on decentralizing after. Just be clear that that is the end goal. Yeah, and something else within that sort of jumping too soon to a decentralized model is you have to launch a token before maybe you know how it's going to work exactly. Um, we chatted about a couple of different examples, um, like the graph, like Pocket, where uh, perhaps they needed to take that centralized approach first, but then at the same time, you know, a lot of the narratives that they were running along uh, is decentralization, and that's actually why they sort of grew a lot of adoption. How do you think about that trade-off between uh, having to launch a token to progressively decentralize, but at the same time when you do that, it comes with you know, such a suite of problems, uh, extra resources, you need to manage that, you need to manage your holders, you need to manage the entire economy, maybe you need to make tweaks to it, that might not reflect well in the token price, it's just, it's just a lot of to handle. Yeah, I mean, being a, a founder in Web3 is, I mean, you have to wear a million different hats. Um, and one of them is, how do you manage this token that you've now introduced? The big, a big challenge of that is like people, if you're um, an end user, let's say you're the consumer or a developer, let's say you're used to using AWS, it's like you go on, you put your credit card in, you pay for it, and like that's the end of the day. Whereas now, it's like if you're a developer, you're like, okay, I have this token, let's say I have to stake it in order to get access to the network, or there's some other mechanism that's required. There's just a whole host of considerations that you have to take on, which you know, frankly, is different from you just deciding, okay, I want to build this for my end users. I don't want to have to think about these other problems. So for the team that's actually building this decentralized infrastructure and relying on a token in some capacities, you have to make it as simple as possible so they don't have to think about it that much. Because otherwise, what will end up happening is people will revert back to the simplest solution, which, you know, quite frankly, could end up being some centralized option. Uh, and you're even seeing that now where, you know, with the graph, they're, they're forcing users to start to use the token, and you're seeing a whole host of centralized 
graph competitors pop up to sort of sap up that excess demand from people who are just like, you know what, screw it, I'll just go towards the centralized option and focus on servicing my users in, in the best way that I can. Yeah, I see largely when projects push out a token just to kind of promote their decentralization, it makes it a lot harder for them to change the to change the product as a whole because it's been tied to an economic model that's very difficult to control. And it could kind of hamper your agility and your nimbleness, and that's what you would want to look out for for an early stage project. You want it to be as nimble as possible. Um, alluding to your point where once you start uh, forcing people to use the token and it proves to be inconvenient, uh, inconvenience is a huge, it's a huge factor for people who want to use a product. Uh, they would, it's very unlikely that they, would, that they will be willing to compromise on their, in, in their efficiency to back up an ideology, uh, especially something that they could foresee to be trivial, like decentralization. We know that it's important, but does everybody know that it's important? Yeah. yeah. And then from the investor side, you know, when we're being asked to invest into a token rather than into an equity company where you know, there's almost no sort of value leakage, um, sometimes that's difficult because you don't know that that token will necessarily accrue value. And now, as it gets more and more crowded within this space, you know, moving up through the stack, um, what, what is left as an investable area within infrastructure broadly? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think as long as you know, we're at this stage where we're still trying to break out towards mainstream user adoption, there will always continue to be entrepreneurs and founders that decide to attack various parts of the stack and either introduce something that's new and improved or you know, they'll look at everything developers are building and say, okay, here's this piece that they're almost exclusively relying on one centralized entity for that. So how, why don't we build the decentralized version of that? So a good example is a, a project called Entropy. And they looked out and they said, okay, everyone's relying on these centralized custodians largely. Like, why don't we build a decentralized custodian? Um, and that, you continue to see that today where, where teams you know, take that approach, just to look at, hey, what's everything out there? As they search for ideas, let's just take one and decentralize it. Um, if you look out on a long-term time horizon, you'd say, like, where, where should I be investing? Um, you'd think that really all the decentralized infrastructure is, like, is the direction that we're heading in. And we're, we're clearly not going backwards or else kind of like, what are we all, what are we all doing here? Um, the challenges that you might run into in the near term are if they have ba bad token economics, even if there's good adoption, it might not do anything for the actual uh, feasibility of that investment. But on the long-term time horizon, you'd think that any piece of the infrastructure stack that's succeeding, developers are using, it's gaining adoption, is going to be a good, you know, good opportunity for you. Yeah. Um, I kind of forgot the question. <laughs> Do you mind repeating? Lost in my uh, Yeah, answer. sort of, in short terms, what are the remaining investable areas within the infrastructure stack? All oh, right. Um, well, I believe because crypto keeps innovating, everything new keeps coming up. Uh, any new innovation will have to come with the supporting tools that come alongside it. And it's very easy to fall into a trap where you would see that you would like to have a more, efficient, a more efficient version of a specific type of infrastructure. But I think that the real opportunity would be looking into newer infrastructure that helps support newer technologies. For example, MEV Boost by Flashbots supports ETH 2.0. And uh, that's a whole new uh, paradigm shift in how infrastructure will work, because it moves away from mining infrastructure into uh, mempool infrastructure, per se. Right, so that's this cycle of where you know, we start with some basic infrastructure, people build some applications that make sense, they soon realize that those applications are actually being throttled by the infrastructure that's built, and so we have to go back and build some better infrastructure. Um, obviously, the most sort of simplest example of that would be throughput of blockchains. You know, I don't know if anyone was playing with DeFi last year, but it got pretty expensive unless you were moving you know, easily five, six figures, you just got eaten away by fees. Um, on that specific sort of topic, though, there's a lot of empty blocks right now. There's a lot of different competing scaling methods. We've gone through from you know, state channels, plasma, side chains, now with roll-ups, more you know, complex, different ways of scaling consensus mechanisms. 
where does it end, right? Right now, clearly applications, or some applications aren't running into those throughput problems, but if we look forwards and compare to, say, payment networks, we do need to scale orders of magnitude to hundreds of thousands, millions of transactions a second. Um, but right now, what's the purpose of sort of trying to build a motorway before the sort of single lane country road isn't even full yet? I guess I would say it ends when people like us stop, stop funding it. <laughs> but until then, uh, it probably won't end. Uh, if you look at the last cycle, so you know, Ethereum had this run. There was clearly issues on its scalability. So then you had all these new layer ones that came out. Uh, in order to sort of address those scalability issues. Uh, what you saw, though, were a lot of entrepreneurs that went out and bought, or, sorry, built very similar things to what was already available on Ethereum, but maybe it was cheaper, but faster. It's very, I think, still challenging for a founder to come up with an idea that addresses some real world use case that uniquely takes advantage of the infrastructure that's being built on. So, you know, a big part of the um, sort of growth narrative for Solana was like, okay, it's, it's way faster, way cheaper, so you're gonna be able to do certain things that you just can, could never do on, on, uh, on Ethereum. And there's a bit of that, so like you have apps like Stepin, it's a mobile app, move to earn. Um, you know, putting aside what it actually does, like it would be really challenging to do that on Ethereum, just the number of users on it. Um, it's a game, so you can't have all these transactions tra 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 be that, that expensive. Uh, so really what you'd, you'd want to see are founders that are building use cases that uniquely take advantage of that infrastructure. And I think it's just still a still big challenge versus a team that can just say, hey, we can do it, and we'll wait for some developer to come up with the ideas. But what we're focused on exclusively is delivering that experience that once they do, you know, we'll be there waiting for them. I see, and I guess the most difficult part about investing in infrastructure is that it comes in so many different shapes and forms in, it, in the way it would function, but the end goal is the same, that you're, it's really quite hard for you to determine which would be the right path to pick. Um, uh, another aspect that I, I would like to talk about is um, how not all infrastructure, even though they're necessary, is easily monetizable. And just because something is useful or like a, a piece of tech is really quite revolutionary doesn't mean somebody would be willing to pay for it. And, and that's one of the difficulties I find in investing in infrastructure. Um, you might end up be building for a large audience that may not be willing to pay for the product. Yeah, I actually just read a tweet saying that um, one of the sort of poisons of Silicon Valley culture is trying to attach venture type business models to businesses that just don't need it because you need to find enough companies to invest in and, and get those venture-like returns. Um, but sort of ex expanding on that, are there other foundational um, you know, pieces of infrastructure that we're still missing that need to be invested in yet? Or is it very much a sort of iterative process from here on out? We've had the, the start of the, um, the wave, and, and we're just trying to improve, get greater throughput, greater dev you know, developer experience, or are there sort of step changes still remaining? Yeah. The, not being a developer is a little challenging for me to speak to this as much, but the piece that seems to have not had as much traction to date is the how a user interacts with a web, a uh, decentralized service. So you have all this back-end infrastructure at the base level, but actually like if you're in, looking at the browser even, um, how can that potentially be decentralized or even like a mobile, mobile operating system? So the expectation is like how do end users use these things, but they're all going through centralized services and it's, it kind of, it also potentially, um, you know, makes it a moot point. Like going, if it's all going through the app store, you know, Apple has the ability to censor anything then. So that would be an area, but I, I just don't think we're, we're there yet. That's kind of way off in the future. You really need users to adopt these things, then we'll deal with Apple later or, or, or Google later. But you know, for now, um, that would be the one piece I haven't seen as much um, you know, founder interest to date. Yeah, I feel anything that would help make a trustless system more easily verifiable is the kind of infrastructure I would like to look out for. Uh, things like um, auditing companies right now, the way that they work is quite inefficient according to, in relation to what's actually executed on chain compared to what they submit to you for an audit. Um, people say that 
one of blockchain's biggest um, benefits is that it can help create a trustless system. But as we could see from what happened with all the rug pulls recently, that trustless systems are not necessarily, they can advertise that they are, and it's very difficult for a regular person to see that, they are, that it is trustless. And you'd have to have some experience with looking through code or like seeing um, the behaviors of the transactions to really guess whether it would be a rug pull or not. And I feel that that is a piece of infrastructure that is missing something that will help make a trustless system more easily verifiable. You know, there's that saying people say, like, uh, trust but verify, but, you know, verifying is really tough if you don't have a technical background. So anything that lowers that gap, I feel, is infrastructure that we will really need if we want to reach mainstream adoption. Right, I think it's inevitable that actually consumers are always going to have rel rely on some sort of brand trust because at the end of the day, you're using an application, you trust that application works, you're not going to every time you open it, check, oh, is it a new smart contract? I need to go in, check that this is all fine because I'm a Solidity engineer, whatever. Um, and so there are some really cool companies working on stuff like auditing marketplaces, making sure that the audits are actually attached to the smart contract rather than just some PDF that you send around afterwards and, and you know, claim that it's, it's relevant. Um, but maybe just as we're sort of coming to the last couple minutes. And Something I'll just add to yeah. the, the investment case is um, there's a, you know, because Web3 investing is largely still a retail driven environment, um, infrastructure is historically much more challenging for the layperson, non developer to understand, which I think creates. Um, you know, challenges if you're expecting these massive price appreciations, if, that, if that's what you're here for. Um, I think on a long-term basis, again, like you're gonna be looking at revenues or are people using this? And is there value being accrued somewhere? But on the short-term basis, like for some of these decentralized infrastructure using Pocket as an example, it's a node service provider, kind of alternative to Infura, like the average person is not gonna understand that. So you just don't have that meme ability mm -hmm. that you get in a lot of other things that are in crypto that you could potentially be investing in a game, a DeFi application, um, or even a layer one, just because like, I think at this point, like most people sort of intuitively understand what a layer one does. Um, so like whether it's middleware or just like general backend infrastructure, like it's just not as exciting for, you know, the crypto Twitter crowd to, to all be talking about in a Discord chat, just because it's like, it's, it's a bit more esoteric and, yeah. and um, you know, it's important, but like, just, you know, the memes aren't, the memes aren't as good. Yeah. Ex except for some very well-marketed examples, like the graph, you yeah. know, with the graph notes that... Or, or link marines. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. And maybe just in five, 10 seconds each, if there's any alpha you want to drop or, or, or last sort of one-liner to share with the crowd. Sharing trade secrets. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if you want to find alpha, I think look at your favorite decentralized applications and try to figure out what they're using. Because that's you know, ultimately whatever developers are actually building with is, you know, theoretically what is actually useful. Um, so that's my. That's so my follow alpha. the devs. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe if you just get as educated as you can on how blockchain works, how all the, in, how the infrastructure that they use works, and from there you can see a gap in the market, and if you spot an opportunity, then you know, form a thesis around it and you know, see, see if it's good enough for you. So do your own research. Yeah, do your own research, guys. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.